In this lesson, we'll talk about basic counting principles. This idea is one that we're using to start working our way towards probability. It might seem a little bit strange at first, but you'll get the hang of it, and then we'll be able to use it to calculate probabilities of lots of different types of events. Let's start off with an interesting example involving passwords. Let's suppose you're forced to make a password. Everybody loves these good old password requirements. You've got to have one capital letter, one lowercase letter, one number. We'll just assume no special symbols or else this gets a little bit too complicated for what I want to use for the example. But whatever the case, assuming we do that, let's find out how easy it is to guess an eight digit password. Now, when a person makes a password under this, they're probably gonna put the capital letter at the front. They're probably gonna put the number at the end. Now this might not be necessarily you, but if it is, just realize I just read your mail. You're a little bit predictable if this is you. So you should probably think about trying to find a way to make your password a little bit more secure. One way in particular is don't just use eight digits, try to put more. Now we're going to suppose that one billion passwords can be checked per second. Rather than spend a lot of time talking about how that can happen, let's just reserve that for another time and make that assumption. Here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to write out eight blanks to represent the password that you're going to be picking. And for each blank, we're going to write out how many possibilities there are for that particular character based on what we're assuming. So for the first one, we're assuming that the first character is a capital letter. All right, if it's a capital letter, how many capital letters are there? There are 26. We're assuming the number is the last character, and that means the rest are going to be lowercase letters. How many choices do I have of picking a lowercase letter? 26. And then the rest of these are also 26s because every one of these values are going to be some sort of lowercase letter in your password. And then finally we get to the number that's the last character. How many choices do you have for a number? If you said 9, that's not exactly right because you didn't include 0. If you go for 0 through 9, there are 10 choices for the number of digit choices you can put in your password. 0 through 9. Now, what are we going to do with these numbers? It turns out, and I'll give you a little bit of a rule for this, that we're actually going to multiply all of these values together to come up with the number of possible passwords. And we'll explain why in a little bit of detail as to where this comes from as to why we should multiply. When I multiply this out, I get 80 billion, 318 million, 101,760. It seems like a pretty big number of passwords. And in some ways, that is a lot of passwords. Now what I'm gonna do is divide by 1 billion passwords per second because that's how many are being checked. And let's see what we get. 80 point, well, let's just round it to three seconds. So if you have your password being checked at this speed, which is possible with the right application, it could take 80 seconds to guess your quote unquote secure password that has a capital at the front, a number at the end, and is the rest lowercase for eight characters. Not very long to guess it. Here's a comic called XKCD that talks a little bit about what's going on with passwords. Unfortunately, our whole password system is a little bit messed up. Feel free to pause and read through this if you want to. It'll give you some ideas for how to create a truly secure password. Now let's do a simple example to talk about why it makes sense to use multiplication. A guest at a catered meal has a choice between five entrees and three desserts. And we're going to say that their dinner is entirely determined by what choice of entree and what choice of dessert they get. And we'll see what different dinner choices there are. Let's find out how many choices we come up with. I'm gonna write down five random entrees and three random desserts things that have come up very frequently when doing this problem with a real class. Okay, maybe the burrito is not that popular, but that's just my personal choice. Anyway, let's see what sort of combinations we can get. You could get the steak and potato with the apple pie, or the steak and potato with the chocolate cake, or the steak and potato with the ice cream. There's three possible outcomes right there. You could get the fried chicken, with the apple pie, or the fried chicken with the chocolate cake, or the fried chicken with the ice cream. And at this point, you might be starting to see what I'm getting at. For each entree, I create three combinations based on the dessert, so we would have something similar. 
If you count all of my lines, you see that there are 15 of them. And basically you've got three lines coming out of each entree, which is why you're simply going to do five times three is 15 dinners. And that is why it makes sense to use multiplication, because when you create combinations of things, you have all the choices of the second one from each choice of the first one. Here's what we call the fundamental counting principle, and this kind of generalizes what we were just talking about. If you break a counting problem into two or more tasks, the first task can be performed in M ways, and after the first task, the second one can be performed in N ways, then the two tasks together are M times N ways to do it. And often think about the word steps. If we're doing steps, then we're setting up multiplication. Now, the order matters in this. Which one is the first one and which one is the second one matters. There is a lot more to this as far as when order doesn't matter, but we're not going to talk about that except in an extra credit assignment. By the way, here's a couple of examples. In the password problem, we had eight steps. The first step was choose the first letter, the capital letter. The second step was choose a lowercase letter. All the way through the seventh step, it was choosing lowercase letters. And then our last step was choose a number. So you had a certain number of ways to do each step, and we multiplied them together. Now let's look at a basic example. A home security code consists of a sequence of two distinct letters, just from A through Z, and we want to know how many different codes are possible. I'm going to set this up the same way I did before. Put blanks for the two characters, and I'm going to multiply them because of this fundamental counting principle. Like I said last time, A through Z has 26 characters. So your first choice, you have 26 choices for your first letter. Now, how many choices do you have for your second letter? If you're saying 26, you're close, but you missed a key word in this problem. This is a word that you should keep looking for. If you see any sort of indication that you have to use a different one from your first choice, where in some way repeats are not allowed, then instead of 26 possibilities here, I have to choose a letter that's different from the one that I chose before. That gives me only 25 possibilities. When I do that, I get 650 codes. Again, this is the idea of what do you do when you have some sort of distinctness between your choices. Here's another example, and this one is a bit of a trick question. A two-digit code is constructed using the digits 1 through 4, and the second digit has to be at least as large as the first digit. There's sort of a requirement on how big the second digit has to be. We want to know how many codes are possible. Well, I will say this much. You have four choices for your first digit, 1, 2, 3, or 4. However, let's just write a few of these down. If you choose one for your first digit, the second digit has to be at least as large, meaning it can be equal, but it has to be greater than or equal to it. So your second digit could be a one, or it could be a two, or it could be a three, or it could be a four. Now, your first digit could be a two as well, but two one is not allowed. The second digit would be smaller than the first in that case. So now we have two two, or it could be two three, or two four. Here's the problem. Depending on what number I choose first, it changes the number of possibilities I have for the second digit. That's a bit of a problem. In order to use the fundamental counting principle, you really need the second choice to be fixed regardless of what your first choice is. If that doesn't work, you need to resort to another method. And here's the method I'm going to use to finish this problem because I'm honestly almost done. Let's just write down all the possibilities. 3, 3, 3, 4, and 4, 4. There are 10 codes possible. Now, if this were much larger, say if they were letters, we'd have to come up with a little system to make it work, and it would be a good bit harder. But just as far as this simple example, we can handle it this way. If we roll two distinguishable dice, how many outcomes are possible? Let me talk about the word distinguishable. This basically says that we're putting an order on this. If we say indistinguishable, or if we don't pay attention to the order, 
we might get a possibility that is the same as another possibility in appearance, but it might actually be a different one. It's very important when you're doing probability to assume distinguishable. Just to give you a visual of what this could look like, let's say on the first die, I get a one. And we'll say it's on a die that I'm coloring green. And the other die, let's say I get a three. That is a three on the red die. So if I have a green die and a red die, I could have a one on the green and a three on the red, or the alternative could be a three on the green and a one on the red. You'll notice that even though these are both the option of one and three, and even just a general sum of four, this is not the same choice because the dice are distinguishable. We will always make this distinction when we're doing probability. Just assume that you can tell the dice apart because in the way that probability works, every die is different. With that said though, two dice, let's just look at our outcomes. For those of you who've run across dice at some point in your life, if not, definitely see if you can get a look at a few. There are six sides on a die. It's a cube, and by the way, the word die is the singular form of dice. It sounds so weird that sometimes you'll hear me say the phrase dice block, just so I can say dice. But anyway, the first one has six outcomes, one through six. The second one has absolutely nothing to do with what the first one gives you. It also has six outcomes. The distinguishable actually makes it so that we can set up the multiplication this way in the first place. If we didn't have it, we would have to assume order doesn't matter, and that causes problems for us. Anyway, there are 36 outcomes on this setup with two dice. And by the way, this 36 is an important number because we're gonna be doing some probability involving dice in the future. Make sure that you're familiar with this number. Oftentimes I'll have students tell me the answer is 12. You can quickly see their mistake in that they're adding instead of multiplying. Always multiply when you're doing this step thing. How many ways can we rearrange the digits of the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? And by the way, we'll count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 as one of those arrangements. Let's see what it looks like, and then I'll mention this word factorial. I'm going to set up five blanks because there's five digits. Basically, I'm scrambling the digits in any way I want to. How many choices do I have for the first number? Well, it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, so I have five choices. Now I'm rearranging the digits, so there are no repeats. Now I have four choices left of whatever's left, then three choices left, then two choices left, then one choice left. If I compute this, I get 120 arrangements of that number, and it does include the possibility of the one, two, three, four, five. Now I mentioned the word factorial. You might have come across this notation somewhere. 5 factorial means exactly what I wrote down there. 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. It's just the idea of taking a falling product until you get all the way down to 1. And these are used anytime you're rearranging something that has all the elements distinguishable. There are plenty of formulas that use it. If you do the bonus assignment, you'll come across that as well. One more thing I want to mention is the word permutation. When we did the problem with the two-letter code, notice we went down by one each time. Sometimes you'll see the word permutation associated with that concept, where you're going down one at a time. It may show up on your homework, but also this is an example as well. As we go down, we've got the number dropping by one each time. Let's look up two more examples that actually are also using the idea of a permutation. The good news is you really don't need to know what a permutation is, you just need to be careful with what you multiply. Now we have three students in the class to fill some special positions. The teacher's pet, the grade beggar, and you can fill in the blank of what pops into your head for that guy. I have some people I've seen in my life that definitely pop into my head for just that guy. The one that pops into my head is when I was in grad school, there was a guy that would walk around campus with long blonde hair, and he had this giant boom box that he would just walk around campus sort of dancing with this giant boom box on his shoulder as he sort of walk danced. Interesting guy. That guy. Anyway, if we want to have three students in this class to fill these special positions, we just claim they're coming out randomly, 
How many ways can they be chosen? Now we need to come up with a number for how many students are in this class. We'll just assume that every one of you watch this video and that 20 of you are in my class. Now there are three positions to fill. Teacher's pet, grade beggar, that guy. And we'll assume that no one gets two jobs, even though that's not written. For the teacher's pet, you have 20 choices. Now for the grade beggar, you have 19 choices because whoever got picked for the teacher's pet is no longer able to be the grade beggar. And now that you've got those two chosen, that guy, or that girl if you'd like, there's only 18 possibilities left. But we stop there. We are going down in our product over time, but we're not going to go all the way down to one because there's only three positions. We're not rearranging the whole class. We're just picking three people out of the 20 in order. I get 6,840 ways to make that choice. And as you might realize, this number would change depending on how many students you're starting with. The more students start up, the higher this number gets. How many four-digit pins can be made from your standard digits of 0 through 9 if no digit is allowed to be used twice? We're looking at a four-digit pin. But remember, no digit can be used twice. No repeats. Repeats are not allowed. Remember, 0 through 9 has 10 possibilities. So your first digit, you're free to choose all 10 of those. And then for the next one, you cannot repeat the first choice, so now you have 9 possibilities. Similarly, the third choice, you have 8 possibilities, and 7 possibilities for the one after that. I get 5,040 pins. By the way, there are 10,000 possibilities if you just do 10, 10, 10, 10. So it's kind of interesting to see that half of those, roughly, have no repeats. That means the other half does have repeats. If you make a four-digit pin that has a repeat in it, that actually doesn't mean it's that insecure, because roughly half of them will have repeats anyway.